Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. In this video, we are talking about the single most impactful book I have ever read, and that is What We Owe the Future by moral philosopher William McCaskill. Now, Will is a pretty amazing guy. He is an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Oxford, and he helped create the effective altruism movement, which is all about using reason and evidence to find the best ways that we can help other people. Now, Will's ideas have already had a big impact on my life, because in 2019, I took the Giving What We Can pledge, which is a pledge to donate 10% of my income every year to cost-effective charities. But this video is about his new book, What We Owe the Future, which is absolutely fantastic and it has already changed the way that I approach what it means to live a good life. And its core argument is that we should be concerned about people who live in the future and that we should take their interests seriously. And that's why we're talking about this book on this episode of Book Club, the ongoing series where we distill and discuss highlights and summaries from some of my favorite books. Anyway, in this video, we're gonna discuss three key points from the book. So firstly, the idea that the future is really big and the people who live in the future matter. Secondly, how we right now might be living in one of the most important times in all of human history. And thirdly, how you and me as individuals can actually do something crucially that helps ensure that the future goes well. Point number one, the future is big, like really big, and future people matter. Okay, so firstly, how big is the future really? Well, Homo sapiens, the human race, the human species, has been around for around 300,000 years, but we only started agriculture about 10,000 years ago, so that's really when things started to really take off. And the life of a typical mammalian species is about a million years. So, even if humans are just the average mammalian species, we are around for another 700,000 years, which is absolutely huge in comparison to our past. But also, we are not just a typical mammalian species. We have the capacity for reason and thought and insight and building cool stuff. So if the future goes well, we could be around for many millions, if not billions of years, more than the traditional classic mammalian species. That means that in the grand scheme of things, we are probably in the first 1% of people in the human species, and the other 99% of people have yet to be born. So that's pretty cool. I hadn't quite appreciated that before or even given it a second thought. But the reason we should care about that is that we should care about the lives of these future people. These future people matter. Now this might seem somewhat counterintuitive and really the first time that I fully appreciated what was going on here is when I had a chat with Will on my podcast and here is what he had to say. So when we look to the future and the potential scale of civilization, a big it's numbers. truly <laughs> immense. Yeah. And why does this matter? Well, it matters because future people matter. If I think about you know, harms and benefits I could prevent or bestow on people the lives today. And then I think, oh, I could also cause harms and benefits to people a hundred or a thousand years time. It just, the distance in time just doesn't really seem to matter in the same way that distance in space doesn't matter. Uh, so what do you mean by doesn't matter? Well, suppose I tell you, you can prevent a genocide. A million people will die. And now I say, oh, but it'll happen in a hundred years time, or it'll happen in a thousand years time or mm. 2000 years time. But the same number of people, for sure, and let's yeah. just assume for sure, will yep. be saved either way. Yep. Are you like, oh, well, 2,000 years doesn't matter. Who cares about that? Like, I don't think so. I think it's like a matter of common sense. that yeah. The mere fact that someone will exist at a later date and time yes. doesn't change their moral status. They have just the same level of moral worth. And so putting these ideas together, and Will makes just a really compelling and clear argument for it, using loads of evidence and numbers and researchers in research and statistics, if that's the sort of thing you care about. But putting this all together, that means that a, we really should care about the lives of people born in the future, and B, because 99% of the human population has not yet been born, the actions that we take right now could well impact their lives for the better or for the worse. Which brings us on to point number two in the book. Point number two, we might be living at one of the most important times in all of human history. Let's start with this timeline from 300,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens first began to exist, to the interesting stuff that's happening now. And now have a look at this graph that shows the total output of the world economy, and something clearly happened at this point. That thing, unsurprisingly, was the Industrial Revolution, where all of a sudden, in the last 250 or so years, we have made unprecedented leaps and bounds and progress in all of the things, basically. Including, crucially, especially in the last 50 to 60 years, the capacity that we have to destroy ourselves. Nuclear weapons were had unprecedented, you know, the atomic bomb had about a thousand times the destructive power of conventional weapons. The hydrogen bomb had about a thousand times greater destructive power than the atomic weapons. That's just like the beginning of like a new era of destructive power. Yeah. Um, I think most scary of all is engineered pandemics, engineered pathogens. Okay. Pandemics could get much worse again if they're with viruses that have been deliberately engineered to be disruptive. So you could imagine a virus that has the fatality rate of Ebola, the infectiousness of measles. Well, now you've got something that like, especially if um, deliberately targeted to do so, could kill very large proportion of the world's population. And then 
In the worst case scenario, it's literally everyone. We're also advancing faster and faster to make new technologies. So things like biotechnologies and bioweapons and artificial intelligence. All of these, we're at a point where things are evolving so rapidly that if these things are misused or not developed correctly, they actually could cause really, really, really bad problems for the human race. Uh, for individual societies, for countries, for continents, and potentially even cause extinction of the human race, which I know it sounds really weird. When I did the conversation with Will, I was just mind blown that this was actually a thing that people are worried about. But genuinely, people are worried about the thing, especially since World War II, where now we have the capacity to destroy ourselves, which we never did in the past. Essentially, all it takes is for one random person, one person who has, is trained in biology or in a biochemical lab or something, and who is a little bit weird, like we've seen in America, what people do when they're a little bit unhinged, school shootings and all that kind of stuff. Imagine if someone like that had access to the capability to genetically engineer a bioweapon. That would be pretty scary. And again, it seems somewhat science fiction, but if you imagine how many weird people there are in the world, even if 0.0001% of the world's population is a little bit unhinged, and if technology is increasing at a rate that makes it a lot easier for people to, to, to develop bioweapons, that means that we're sitting on a real big problem on our, on our hands that genuinely could change the course of human civilization if we don't do something about it. That's just one of the scary examples. He talks about a bunch more in this, and there's another great book by Toby Ord called The Precipice that talks about other risks to humanity, including some super interesting and scary stuff around moral value lock-in, which is too much to go into in this particular video, but he talks about it in the book, and you can learn more about it in the podcast interview that I did with Will that's linked down below if you want to check it out. But the nice thing about this book and why it's been kind of praised by so many people is that this is not a doom and gloom type thing. It's not like, oh my god, guys, end of the world, tinfoil hats, like, uh, just, just like hunker up and get some tinned beans. Instead, it's a surprisingly cheerful and optimistic book that talks about crucially, what we can do about all of these problems. Key point number three, you as an individual can actually do something to help ensure that the future goes well. And kind of the metaphor here is that if you're setting off on a bit of a risky journey, you don't really know what the terrain's gonna look like if you're on a bit ex expedition in uncharted territory. You kind of don't know what the territory is gonna look like, you don't know what the potential risks might be, but you can prepare yourself for those risks. You would make sure you wear the right kind of clothing, you've got the right kind of maps, you've got your water purification tablets, you've done the things that you can to make sure that even even though the future is uncertain, you could potentially be better prepared for it. So what are the things that we can do right now, given that A, the future is important, people in the future matter, we're living at a ridiculously important time in human history, and we want to make a difference with our lives. What are tangibly, practically, actionably the things that we can do to actually make a difference? Well, the first one, as he talks about in the book, is actually figuring out what to do with your career in a way that can have maximum impact. Now, there's a bunch of fields like, you know, artificial intelligence, for example. You know, one of the big risks to humanity is that AI is evolving so fast that at some point, and most experts put it at like, you know, somewhere between 10 and 50%, in the next 50 to 100 years, there is a risk that artificial intelligence could eclipse human intelligence, and then we don't know what's gonna happen there. Yes, there's like a doomsday scenario of machines taking over the world, but like, there's also loads of other bad things that AI could potentially lead to. And crucially, as of 2020, there were about 40,000 people in the world working to make AI more powerful. And there's countries, you know, the US and Russia and China all having this almost AI arms race to try and make artificial intelligence more and more and more powerful. But as of 2020, there were only around 300 people in the world actually researching, how do we make AI safer? And given that, the risks of artificial general intelligence are potentially catastrophic to the human race if we don't do something about it. The fact that there are so few people comparatively in the field of AI research means that if, for example, you're a computer scientist or an engineer or a software developer or a mathematician, and you're looking for something impactful to do with your career, shifting your career in the, in the direction of, hey, if I can be one of the people to help reduce the likelihood that AI is gonna completely destroy us, that would be a huge impact. Those sorts of career changes, career tra trajectories, and figuring out what to do with your career could really make an enormous difference. Similarly, let's look at pandemic prevention. If, for example, you are a doctor, yes, you could have lots of impact by saving one life at a time, and that's all well and good but you can have a potentially ridiculously large impact by getting involved in the field of pandemic prevention and doing research around that kind of stuff. Now in the book, he talks about a bunch more things, but he refers us over to 80,000 Hours, which is an organization that Will McCaskill actually co-founded. I've interviewed the other co-founder of it and a few other people like they're based just down the road you know, here in London. And the whole point of that organization, it's a nonprofit, all of their stuff is free. The whole point is that it helps people like us figure out what careers that we can have to maximize our useful impact and the amount of help that we can be to the world while also making sure we're having fun and being fulfilled in our career and all that kind of stuff. They're not sponsoring this video or anything. I just think the organization is sick. So you can check out, I'll put links down below to all of their free resources so that if you are thinking of potentially orienting your career towards impact, you can definitely find out more at 80,000 hours. Also, they've got a newsletter where twice a month they send out details about impactful careers and new research on the topic. And they've got completely free one-on-one -on -one career consulting type service where they literally hop on a call with you completely for free. Again, it's not a sponsored video. I'm not being paid to say this. 
this completely, completely for free. They'll hop on a call with you and help you figure out what to do with your career, which is sick. I've had one of these calls. It's fantastic. And it, it's free because it's a nonprofit and it's funded by other kind of effective altruism, open philanthropy, funds like that, where the aim is to help people actually shift their careers to do more good with them, potentially even for the long-term future. And it's called 80,000 hours, by the way, because 40 hour work week times 50 weeks a year times 40 years of a traditional career equals 80,000 hours, which is the amount of hours you are spending in your career. And so spending those hours doing something that can genuinely change the course of the future could potentially be a very impactful way to spend your time. What else can you do? Well, you can read the book, you can listen to my podcast, you can check out more of Will's stuff, you can help spread these ideas, which is kind of what I'm trying to do here. If I can help more people get interested in this sort of thing and recognize, hey, this long-term stuff is actually super important, then that means that I'm having more of an impact through things, silly things like this YouTube channel, which is awesome. You can also donate your money to more effective causes. So for example, you can take the Giving What We Can pledge, 10% of your income every year. I do it, loads of other people do it. You can join, link down below. But let's just have a look at the difference in funding between counter-terrorism and pandemic prevention. This graph shows how many people were killed by pandemics in the last 10 years, compared to how many people were killed by terrorists in the last 10 years. And this graph shows how much funding pandemic prevention has compared to the amount of funding that counter-terrorism has. And it's just kind of stuff like that where there are things that can really genuinely impact the present day and also the long-term future that are just so underfunded. You know, AI safety is underfunded, pandemic prevention is underfunded. There's a bunch more stuff that he talks about in the book and that 80,000 hours talks about that are completely underfunded. And you can check out a charity evaluator called GiveWell, again, nonprofit, and their job is to analyze the cost effectiveness of, of different charities so that you can donate your money to funds or charities that are aimed at trying to do the best good possible whether it's in the present day or over the long term. So all this stuff is super interesting. If any of the ideas in here vibe with you, you should definitely check out the book. It's actually sick, what we owe the future. It's very readable. It's very, just has completely changed the way I see the world and see the problems in the world. And just, I've never before appreciated like, I feel like my brain has had a software level up by virtue of reading this book. So you should definitely check it out, link down below. And if you enjoyed this video, you might like to check out the full three hour long conversation I had with Will McCaskill on my podcast. That'll be linked right over here where we talk about this stuff in way more detail, along with a bunch of other stuff like what it's like being a philosophy professor and a load of productivity hacks if you're into that kind of thing. Anyway, check that out over here. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you hopefully in the next video. Bye-bye.